Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, and that's H.G., not H.D., as some of you occasionally write. I'm not a television set. Thank you very much. This video is going to set out something of a framework for you to help you understand context, both in with regards to my work, so that you are able to place what I write about and what I talk about within a particular framework, and also to help you understand with regard to improving your own situation. And this appertains to the classifications of individuals that I talk about, so that you then have the appropriate lexicon and framework to apply to your own situation. So it's about the classification of people. So I'd like you to imagine a spectrum from left to right, a line. And on the far left-hand side, we have the empath group. And I'll be returning to them shortly. The empath group contains individuals who have high levels of emotional empathy for a wide range of people. Those individuals have empathic traits such as compassion, the desire to heal and fix, being an excellent listener, decency, honesty and so forth. People within that group also have narcissistic traits, jealousy, anger, infidelity, vanity. But those narcissistic traits, even though sometimes they can be quite strong, they're not as strong as the empathic traits. So imagine, if you will, that the narcissistic traits have a shell of empathic traits around them that always keeps them, most of the time, in check and under control, so that the narcissistic traits manifest in a healthy way for those individuals. The empath group do not need control over people. They don't need to manipulate. And indeed, although they are capable of manipulation, they are generally not very good at it because it's not something that they need in their lives. They don't need it to function. The empath group have different coping mechanisms. Also, those in the empath group have an addiction to the narcissist. And if you want to understand more about what causes that addiction, what it does, and more importantly, how you can manage it, then you need to go to the Knowledge Vault and obtain the Addiction Triple Package. That is fundamental material for understanding who you are if you are an empath and what this addiction means for you. So those are essentially the key classification and aspects of the empath group. On that spectrum, move to the right. We now have the normals. The normals are the largest group in the world. The empathic group, roughly speaking, two in six people will be empathic, uh, belonging to the empath group. And that's roughly speaking. Of the normals, somewhere around about two and a half, 2.75 out of six people. So this is the much largest group. In this group, the normals also have emotional empathy, and they can have a lot of it, but they have a much narrower radius. So the people in the normal group have emotional empathy, for instance, for their children, for their parents, brother and sister, some friends, colleagues, a neighbour perhaps, but not for a stranger, not for an acquaintance, not for somebody on the other side of the world that they don't know. And that manifests at times with regard to certain behaviour. So, for example, a parent will exhibit emotional empathy towards their child, but less so towards a stranger who pushes in front of them in a line, and they're likely to respond in a way without emotional empathy towards that individual. That they would be moved to help the son of a friend with regard to donations because he needs some kind of medical treatment, but they'd be less moved to help a complete stranger because of the absence of emotional empathy for that grouping. 
I often refer to the normals as nose-down normals. These people are not bad people, but they're imbued with a degree of selfishness in order to propel them through life. They have to look after for themselves and those immediately around them. And because they're not empaths, they are not overly concerned with the wider range of people. They wouldn't go out of their way to hurt them, but nor would they go out of their way to necessarily help them either. The normals have both empathic and narcissistic traits, but they generally are smaller in number and less powerful. Normals just want to get through life with a minimum of fuss and inconvenience. They're not there to control the world and they're not there to save it. Certainly they can be harnessed by empaths to help save the world and they can be harnessed by narcissists in order to cause problems in the world. But they intrinsically don't look to do that themselves. They need to look to themselves and those around them and get through life. It's this group of people who, for instance, if you're telling them about your problems with the narcissist, they'll listen, they'll go, mm-hmm, uh-huh. But they soon move on. They're not particularly interested, not because they don't care, but because their levels of emotional empathy are such that either you don't fall within the grouping, or if you do, they will help to a degree, but they're not crusaders. And these are the individuals who often, you might think, they just don't get it. And in fact, that's true, they do not. Those in the normal group can be ensnared by narcissists, but they don't have the addiction. And therefore, they are more likely, when a narcissist comes a-knocking, to think something isn't right here and walk off. So, for instance, during the love-bombing phase of a seduction, they would think, this guy, he's ringing me every day, he's sending me all of these texts, he's buying me gifts and he doesn't know me. Something's off here, it's too much for me. No, thank you. They will not be blinded by emotional thinking. Normals can become ensnared. It's less likely, and they are harder for a narcissist to hold on to. That's why we prefer empaths. Move to the right again. And we have a small group here sort of 0.5 out of 6, 0.75 out of 6. Narcissistic individuals. These are not narcissists. They are narcissistic individuals. They have some empathic traits, but they have much larger narcissistic traits. And they have some emotional empathy, but it's low. They don't have it for many people at all, and it is not extensive. These are the individuals who are selfish and can be manipulative, but they do have some emotional empathy there. Do not confuse this group with narcissists. Do not think when you have had somebody who's confirmed as a narcissist that they belong in this group. They do not. But there is a small group, relative-wise to the other groups, of individuals who are narcissistic, meaning they have a lot of strong narcissistic traits, some empathic traits, but they're not as strong, and they have some emotional empathy, but it's limited. And often, these individuals have to have pointed out to them that their behaviour is wrong, and they reflect and change it. So this is the group where, for instance, you might get somebody who is quite young and is leading a reckless and uh, somewhat dysfunctional life, but they're put upon some kind of rehabilitation programme. These are the individuals where some change can be made. And sometimes people think that these are narcissists who become reformed. You can't reform a narcissist. You can't change a narcissist. This group are the ones where you see success on uh, outreach programs for people. So the 19-year-old boy who's been committing crime because he's narcissistic and he hasn't been given any influence and guidance as how to control that behaviour, but because he does have some emotional empathy, but it's not been tapped into, he can be given the tools to enable him to do that, to lead a more constructive life, to stay out of trouble, to think before he acts, to not fall prey to the narcissistic traits as much. He doesn't have a compulsive need to control like the narcissist. He doesn't need fuel. But he can behave in a reckless way, because of limited emotional empathy and because his narcissistic traits, selfishness, vanity, pride, anger, outrank the other ones. So he will go around causing problems. But these are the individuals 
where change can be effected. So sometimes you'll come across people who say, oh, we worked with this young offender or this troubled individual, and he turned his life around. It does happen, clearly, but those are not narcissists, and it's very important for people to understand that. Move to the right again, and here's our final group, the narcissists. Roughly one in six of the population. There are far more of us than people realise, but we're still a minority, albeit a sizable one. The key aspect of us is that we have no emotional empathy whatsoever. We cannot change. We need fuel, character traits and residual benefits, the prime aims. We operate through the instigation of control over people to achieve those prime aims through manipulations. Within this group, there are different schools of narcissists, which I will return to in a moment. We are not capable of change. We cannot be put upon the offender rehabilitation program and change be affected. There might be a short-term alteration, which is done for the purpose of asserting control over those around the narcissist, but the narcissist will revert back to those behaviours. They are pathological, deep-seated and immovable. And you cannot, cannot, cannot change a narcissist. It is impossible. Why? Because by the time that we have become a narcissist, the cake is baked, and it can't be unbaked. It's a fully formed self-defense mechanism. And I will be talking in another video in due course about why the narcissist cannot be changed. There are those that suggest that that can happen. It can't. And I will go into more detail about that on another occasion. So, in terms of understanding my work, think of those classifications of empath, normal, narcissistic and narcissists. Those are the four groupings who all interact with one another. Now, within the empath group, I classify by school. So you have a standard empath, which is the largest group, then codependence, the next largest group, super empaths, a smaller group, and contagion, which are the rarest. Four schools. People who are empaths are an amalgam of different parts of those schools. They'll usually have at least two, maybe all four. And they'll have differing aspects of those schools, differing percentages that constitute what they are and the associated behaviours. And I'll be going into those various schools in other material, but it's important to understand there are four. And different narcissists prefer different school of empath for reasons that will be explained on another occasion. There are also five cadres, and the cadres l overlay on top of the schools. So, there is Giza, Magnet, Saviour, Carrier, and Martyr. Those are the five schools. So, you could have somebody who is a majority standard empath with a super empath minority element, who is of a majority Giza cadre with a minority magnet element. So you have both school and cadre. And again, there are various attributes which are applicable to those five cadres. And again, different narcissists are attracted to different types of cadre as well. Like the schools, the empaths can have representation from one or more of those cadres. Usually there's at least two present and in differing proportions. My empath detector test enables you to ascertain whether you are an empath and, if so, what school and cadre you are and what that actually means in terms of your relationship with narcissists. And if you'd like to look at that, please go to the menu bar at narcsite.com. You'll see detectors and in there is the empath detector test. It'll allow you to understand more about you. So those are the schools and cadres of empaths that I talk about. I don't talk about any other label, name, category. Those are the relevant aspects. What about the narcissists? I divide the narcissists into three groups, what I call schools. Lesser, mid-range, and greater. And then there is me, the ultra. There'll be more material about me in accordance with this channel. But for now, I'm going to focus on the other three schools, namely lesser, mid-range, and greater. Lesser narcissists are divided into four subschools: lower lesser, middle lesser, 
upper lesser type A and upper lesser type B. They have certain things in common, but also certain differences. And there will be further material that appertains to those differences and characteristics to help you understand. Essentially, at this juncture, lessers, they don't know what they are. They won't change. They have no emotional empathy and they have no cognitive empathy either. So they tend to be fairly obvious in the way that they behave. The subschools reflect differing characteristics, differing levels of capability, uh, differing uh, levels of success, uh, differing levels of charisma, uh, differing manipulations. Lessers are a sizable group within the group of narcissists. The next group, mid-range. These are often the hardest to spot. And there are four subschools. Lower mid-range, middle mid-range type A, middle mid-range type B, upper mid-range. Mid-range narcissists have no emotional empathy, but they do have cognitive empathy in varying degrees, and that is reflected by the different subschools. They also operate facades. Again, there are differences with regard to how often the facade is used and its effectiveness. They are generally passive-aggressive compared to the more aggressive behaviours of the lesser narcissists. They tend to be more successful, though not always. Their cognitive function largely is higher than lessers, but sometimes can be different. But on general, in general terms, it is higher. Mid-range narcissists, again, don't know what they are and will never change. And they are the largest group of narcissists. Some people use the term covert narcissist. I don't like that because I don't find it apt in terms of description. Because covert could cover mid-range and greater. And as you will find through my work, there are huge variations within that. So to call somebody a covert narcissist is actually very unhelpful. It's like, in essence, saying it's green when there is forest green, lime green, pea green, grass green, leaf green. Think of all of the thousands upon thousands of shades of green that there are. So there are variations. So I do not like the term covert narcissist at all. You can talk about covert behaviours, but not a covert narcissist. Then there is the greater school. Lower greater, middle greater, and upper greater. Greater narcissists are very, very rare. Often people say, HG, I've been ensnared by a greater. You probably have not. And it's an honest mistake that people make. Greater narcissists know what they are, are aware of being a narcissist. That doesn't mean that they're aware in terms of choosing to be a narcissist. It means they already are one and they know what they are. Lesser and mid-range narcissists wholly operate through instinct. Greater narcissists have some instinctive behaviour, but a lot of it is calculated. Greater narcissists have a high cognitive function, have no emotional empathy, but demonstrate cognitive empathy, and can do so in a way which makes them very difficult to spot and causes many people to think that they're actually empathic when they're not. Greater narcissists have very large fuel matrices, are often very successful, uh, can be famous as well. And there can be famous individuals in lesser, usually upper lesser, and in mid-range, but you find many famous narcissists in greater also. I will, in future work, be telling you much more about the various schools, how they operate, to enable you to understand the various functions. But the main distinctions between them are Lesser and mid-range narcissists operate through instinct. They don't know what they are, and they will not change. Lesser narcissists tend to be more rudimentary in their behaviours, tend to be fairly obvious, and have no emotional empathy and no cognitive empathy. Mid-range narcissists are passive-aggressive, often think of themselves as good people when they're not. They have a wider range of manipulations than lesser. They can operate with charisma. 
They have no emotional empathy but have cognitive empathy. Greater narcissists operate through some instinct but mainly calculation, know what they are, have no emotional empathy and have extensive cognitive empathy. All three groups will never change. Lesser and mid-range will not change because they don't know what they are and therefore their narcissism will protect them against any attempt to change them. Greater narcissists are incapable of change and moreover see no reason why to change. They're so effective, why alter that which is effective? And in due course, I will be giving you a lot more information about these various schools, both with regard to narcissists and empaths. If you want to determine whether you're with a narcissist, use the NARC detector consultation, which you'll find in the menu bar at narcsite.com. This is a comprehensive consultation which will help you understand are you with a narcissist and if so why or that you're not and why and if they are the school and the cadre and this is very helpful in terms of giving you a solid foundation of logic on which to base a no contact regime and also so you can understand what the narcissist will do is likely to do and just as importantly what they're not going to do so that you can ha gain some comfort and assurance and not worry unnecessarily I have done thousands upon thousands of these consultations. Utilize them. You will find them very, very useful and a huge investment with regard to achieving freedom. So this is the context, if you will, of my work in terms of that spectrum and those classifications with regard to empath and narcissists. Use this information as the platform on which to bolt on the other videos which show the interaction between all of these groups, the machinations, the manipulations, the dynamic. Follows into the explanations about the fuel matrices, the positions within the fuel matrices, the intimate partner primary source, tertiary secret, etc., primary, secondary, tertiary sources, and so forth. But this is a platform uh, video which gives you that context and enables you now to understand more about my work and placing within that framework. Thank you for listening.